God. Some would refer to me as that. From a certain point of view, it is right to view me as such. But at the same time, I am not. I am also a part of you. In actuality, I do not have a physical form. I am in existence of a higher dimension. A place where time and space is control. The fluctuating void. The Zohar is a religious text that lays the foundation of a type of Jewish mystical thought known as Kabbalah. The text itself is said to explain the secrets of the Bible, the universe, and every aspect of life. The word Zohar can be translated from Hebrew to mean radiance, which, given the assertion that it unlocks the secrets of the Judeo-Christian faith system, is quite fitting. Those who believe in this line of thinking allege that in the second century, Shimon bar Yohai hid in a cave for 13 years following the siege of Jerusalem. In that time, he studied the Torah and wrote the Zohar based on the verbal teachings passed down from Moses after receiving the Ten Commandments from God. However, it's important to note that a wide swath of people in the Jewish faith do not currently consider the Zohar canon to their teachings choosing instead to remove most, if not all, Zohar-related content from their prayer books. What does all of this have to do with a big hunk of metal in a video game, then? Well, we have to fast forward a couple millennia to understand that. Tetsuya Takahashi and Soria Saga are both pretty big fans of Western media. Star Wars, Robert A. Heinlein, and Isaac Asimov are a few examples. For the purposes of this video though, we're going to focus on Arthur C. Clarke's 2001 A Space Odyssey. The concept of the monolith directly inspired the creation and concept of the Zohar, as well as the name of the studio itself. Monoliths are black, hexahedral shapes with many varying sizes. Some are as small as a building, while others are as large as 2 kilometers. One thing that remains consistent is their exact dimensional ratio of 1 by 4 by 9 which assuages all doubt that they're naturally occurring. This ratio is significant because each part is a square of 1, 2, and 3 respectively. Later in the story, monoliths are revealed to be created by an alien race dubbed the Firstborn, which travel the vast reaches of outer space millions of years before humans even existed. They left behind these slabs to further the evolution of struggling planets. It's a combination of both the religious themes and name of the Zohar with the form and function of the monoliths that create the Zohar we know. Also known as the conduit for those of you more familiar with Xenoblade, the Zohar is an extremely complex recurring element throughout the games. It is easily the most powerful object in the entire meta series. In each sub-series, the scenario surrounding the Zohar is slightly different, but the core concept largely remains the same. I think it goes without saying that this video contains spoilers for almost every Xeno game. Sorry Xenoblade X. In 2001, a mysterious object is dug up, typically in Africa, that changes the course of human history forever. Humans realize that this object may be as old as the universe itself, 
and is the source of infinite energy, being described as a perpetual motion machine. And of course, they get right to work on attempting to harness it. I'm not describing one game, but several games. Despite their vast differences in setting, these events always happen and lead to catastrophe. And it's always because of the Zohar. The Xenogear Zohar is essentially a monolith with an eyeball slapped on it. In Gears, the eyeball piece is actually what's on Earth, and the rectangle around it is assembled later. It's dubbed MAM, or Magnetic Abnormal Matter, because of its strange magnetic properties, but is later renamed to Zohar. Thousands and thousands of years pass, and eventually a theory was posited involving the Zohar called Phenomenon Phase Shift that could be used to do literally anything. Depending on how connected you are with the Zohar, it will literally manifest whatever you desire. Truly awesome. An example of this would be if you wanted to ask out that cute girl you know who likes anime. If your desired outcome is that she says yes, the Zohar will then calculate every single possible outcome and manipulate reality in such a way that she'll say yes. Your dreams could be made a reality. While progress is made on studying this theory, the massive biocomputer hybrid Deus is completed and the Zohar is implemented as the power source. In order to manage and allow both systems to communicate, a program called Kadamini is installed into the iris of the Zohar. An event occurs soon after which randomly traps an extra-dimensional being inside of the Zohar. Yeah, that went from 0 to 100 real quick. To not spoil what's left of Xenogear's plot for everyone who's still curious, I'll just say that this event makes what already is the most powerful object in the universe even more powerful. The Zohar is... elusive. Perhaps the single most elusive phenomenon in the entire franchise. Which makes things all the more fun for us, because it's also the gravitational center of the Xeno solar system, as it were. Woven as deeply into the fabric of these stories as it is, we need to simplify things down to a workable baseline that relates directly to the Zohar. That way, we can avoid becoming too lost in a forest of metaphors and allegories that are way beyond our scope here. So, as previously stated, the Zohar represents a physical link between a higher dimension, the upper domain of the wave existence, from which all ether flows, and what is essentially our own universe, the lower domain of man. This gate, as it were, was also believed to be the origin of all life, and implied to have driven the evolution of mankind itself. Functionally, that's actually all it is. An unknowable phenomenon, with a modifier built around it, to harness its extreme ability to manipulate reality, that acts as a cage for an entity beyond comprehension. It's that being within it that gives the Zohar the presence and will that we see in the narrative. The wave existence, imprisoned in an artifact that serves only to exploit it, for that nectar of perfect power that makes the Zohar what it is, wishes only to become whole by returning to the rest of itself in the upper domain. And the only way to do that is to destroy the Zohar modifier itself, through the disparate shards of its own power in the lower domain. So yes, the de facto consciousness of the Zohar wants to destroy the Zohar. Huh. In symbolic terms, the Zohar is akin to the forbidden fruit in regards to the particular allure it has for people throughout the series, that being the ascension of humanity to a higher realm or an enlightened human reaching the realm of God. This is built off of Gnosticism, a core foundation of Zeno's philosophy. Gnostic belief interprets the god of the Old Testament to be a false deity, the Demiurge, represented in Xenogears by Deus, who is essentially fueled by the power of the Zohar, instead worshipping what they see as the true god, Monad, allegorical in this case to the entity within the Zohar. In order to escape the imprisonment of the Demiurge, it's believed that transcendence from the mortal world and the achievement of Gnosis, or enlightenment, is necessary. Putting all of this into the context surrounding the Zohar, Deus, the Demiurge, crashes on Xenogear's world and creates the first humans to repair itself. Those humans, under the banner of being God's chosen people, create a false church, Ethos, and aim to guide humanity towards reunification with their creator. 
That is, in so many words, the imprisonment of the Demiurge, made into a systemic curse. And, on the other end of the aisle, we have Carolyn, the main antagonist, whose true objective is to go to the place of God, or the upper domain, and unite with the wave existence. This is, of course, transcendence from the nature of the mortal world into a higher realm, where God, the Manad, resides. Enlightenment, a way to attain Gnosis. Xenogears accepts neither of these. Instead, the characters reject both the imprisonment of the Demiurge and the realization of Gnosis simultaneously by destroying their link to the very source itself and choosing instead to walk hand in hand in a sort of ideal of human togetherness, in a way marking that as what the narrative believes to be the true meaning of existence. Tatsuya Takahashi and many others left Squaresoft after unsuccessful attempts to get a green light for Xenogears 2. In order to allow their vision to be fully realized, they created Monolith Soft. The thematic framework of the story they wanted to tell clearly wasn't changed because the Zohar plays a central role in Xenosaga as well. This time, the Zohar gains the appearance of a cross and has a complex design at the center, rather than an eye. This Zohar also forms a connection between an extra-dimensional being, Udu. And like in Xenogears, this also gives the Zohar more power. The Zohar spends thousands of years being moved around due to countless wars over its possession, and is eventually sealed away due to the danger that it poses. Regardless, efforts are made to copy it, and the Zohar emulators are created. While not nearly as powerful as the original, they still share similar qualities such as attracting Gnosis and generating immense power. Twelve of them were created, and each bears a different Hebrew letter on the front. There's a thirteenth one, but it sucks, and it's gray, and it thematically doesn't match the others, so I'm not going to waste any time explaining it. Each emulator corresponds to one of Jesus Christ's twelve apostles, and the original is referred to as Marienkind, which translates from German as Child of Mary, implying that it represents Jesus Christ himself. The Zohar and its emulators are all typically used to power titanic machinery, just like the Gears version. Unlike the Gears version though, it seems that merely coming into physical contact with it causes the victim to completely disappear. Ether itself is also connected to the Zohar. In Xenosaga's world, people are typically able to harness Ether, either by the use of nanomachines or by some extraneous means, like a connection with the Zohar. Depending on the strength of the connection, you're able to perform more powerful Ethers. This is functionally the same as in Xenogears, where all of it comes from a link to the upper domain. So, fundamentally, this version of the Zohar is roughly parallel to the first one. However, as we've seen, there's a lot of contextual distinctions to make. When it comes to the actual physical object, well, that's just it. The phenomenon referred to as the Zohar doesn't physically manifest as… anything. It isn't an object by nature. More accurately, while people can see and touch it as one, it only exists as an object to them because that's what they perceive it to be. It's their understanding of its existence, as a door between their realm and that of Udu's upper domain, through which immense energy flows. Essentially, in Xenosaga, all consciousnesses exist together in an imperceivable realm, with no boundaries or separation between them. In other words, it's the collective unconscious, or Anus Mundus, where everything is completely connected. Some people fear certain aspects of this and reject it, evading that unity, plunging the Unus Mundus into a crisis. It's like a domino effect, one, and then another, and then another, scattering and dispersing, eventually dissolving as a unit entirely, and dragging the universe down with it. Udu observes this phenomenon in action, and is curious as to why anyone would choose that over the collective unconscious. It has a vested interest in the human condition, wanting to understand those of the lower domain. Why do people wish for their own isolation? Why do they reject the very nature of the world, condemning the domains to collapse in the process? Why do they wish, even up to the moment that the universe itself vanishes? So Udu watches, contemplating humanity without end, an observer, 
at once unfathomably distant and yet far too intimate for the unprepared minds of people that made contact with it during this process. Even the Zohar's interaction with this interest led to a violent backlash from it that engulfed the Earth in a phase shift. So to solve this? Xenosaga's main antagonist implements a measure by which to counteract the universe's collapse, rewinding time before the breaking point, and living out a loop forever. It's an eternal recurrence, salvaging something from that apparent bleak inevitability. This actually requires using the original Zohar to sabotage Udu's connection to the lower domain, interrupting his observation, and making it easier to control the flow of Anus Mundus. That whole idea, that whole repetition of the world, is actually another interpretation of the imprisonment of the Demiurge, complete with a divine figure perpetuating a cycle that humanity is locked within. Xenosaga rejects this, of course, and places faith in everyone finding the key to stopping the oncoming collapse, deciding the future for themselves. In Xenoblade 2, the Zohar appears for a third time, also called the Conduit, or Gate in the Japanese script. It's similar in shape to Xenosaga's, but lacks any sort of pattern or texture, and seems to be made purely out of energy. Klaus believes that the Conduit is a gift from a divine entity, which is technically possible if you're open to the interpretation that Udu and the Wave Existence are divine entities. Galea thinks that it's a stretch to call it that, and instead just simply refers to it as a meta-universe manifold which pretty much just means multiversal joint. Regardless, it's entirely possible that both of them are correct in their assumptions. After its discovery, the institution Iodos is formed to research and maintain it. The conduit is kept in check by the man-made Trinity Processor, composed of Ontos, Logos, and Numa. Each of them corresponds to a line in the Book of Proverbs from the Bible. Proverbs 3.13 Blessed are those who find wisdom, those who gain understanding. Proverbs 4.18 The path of the righteous is like the morning sun, shining brighter till the full light of day. Proverbs 10.12 Hatred stirs up conflict, but love covers all wrongs. This system of artificial intelligence was created not only to direct the conduit's power as a single unified AI, but to protect it as well. The Trinity Processor created the artifices like Siren to defend against anyone who would dare pose a threat to them in the conduit. This role and functionality is extremely similar to that of Kadamini from Xenogears. Coincidence? I think not! and administratively also represents the Zohar emulator's purpose of prompting the original's activation. Not to mention that Siren is powered by a slave generator connected to the processors, just like Deus and its creations. I think- When even the artifices aren't enough to protect it from the Saviorite rebels, Klaus decides to conduct his phase transition experiment with the conduit, and Earth is entirely engulfed in energy, and does... uh... that. From this point forward, the conduit is silent for millennia, until Rex helps Pyra and Mithra attain their true form. This allows Rex and Numa to take full advantage of a Trinity Core's direct connection to the conduit and rewrite local reality, which could also be called Phenomenon Phase Shift. Yet again, while much of its foundations are identical to the other versions, this Zohar is positioned in a way that's actually quite distinct. Within Xenoblade, it fits into a thematic core of humanity's supposed cyclical corruption and destruction of itself, a rhythm to their existence that's perceived to be as natural as it is inevitable. That limitless well of potential that is the Zohar is key to how this entire worldview is established. Before its discovery, mankind, by the era of 20XX, had formed a unified government of Earth, or a coalition, if you will. People were deeply flawed, as they'd always been. And yet, progress had been achieved. In the words of Klaus, The world was an unseemly place, though glimpses of beauty persisted. But things changed with the discovery of the Zohar. 
In its classic form as a higher, unknowable existence, it again served as humanity's forbidden fruit, as it were. With the realization of what it was capable of, came tears in the seams of humanity's unity, as its power was both misused and craved. The common theme shared between all competing sides was the hubris the Zohar enabled. With that power within their grasp, and a dependence on its might quickly taking root, it seemed to be an invitation to disaster, and it was. What came next? We know well. The Saviorites, the Trinity, Klaus, the experiment. The earth was ravaged, and with it, the cycle of destruction and recreation was fulfilled. All rest follows a similar course, in that the power of the conduit, through Numa and Logos, exacerbates and intensifies the issues that this humanity shares with their previous state. The development of the Trinity course ultimately tends towards first breaking the hold of the demiurgic figure, and then towards divorcing all of their destinies from the Zohar, in favor of placing faith in the connection between humans and blades, defying both the idea of the cycle and civilization's dependence on that divine object that influences their evolution. Similarly, the Zohar's place in the world of Bionis and Mechonis is facilitated through the Trinity Core Ontos, or Alvis as we know him, who became entangled with the conduit just as the wave existence did, though in a very different way, and with a very distinct dynamic. Ontos is a man-made machine of the lower domain that became part of the conduit, showing absolutely no desire to separate from it, and merely continuing to operate within programming. The core point being, here too, the allure of the gate's providence over the world, through Ontos and the various keys to its power. These keys established a dynamic of inherent dependence, or subservience, to the presence of the Zohar, and that thread is cleanly broken by the end, by Shulk annihilating Zanza, the figure of the Demiurge. Then, once both realms step out of its shadow, there seems to be no more purpose in its staying attached to either universe. Shulk turns down divine transcendence, and the conduit vanishes from all rest. Thus, the realization of Gnosis is rejected in both as well. The Zohar is secreted away, hidden from mortal existence, as they move forward. It's pretty clear to see that while each Zohar is functionally similar at a base level, each one is thematically relevant and unique in their own ways. They're woven into the fabric of the series so tightly, it would be hard to imagine moving forward without them. The Zohar is an inevitable force that presides over these universes. Even though the conduit has seemingly vanished from all rest, I'm sure that there are still more secrets to uncover. While a direct connection to Xenogears is dubious at best, a connection between Xenosaga and Xenoblade is certainly on the table. Among the inclusion of Cosmos and what is essentially a Gnosis, Xenoblade's conduit has unmistakable similarities with Saga's Zohar. Now that we have a clear picture of what Xenoblade 3 is going to be, it's only a matter of time before we figure out where the conduit fits into this mess. There are infinite possibilities to explore countless dimensions and colorful characters we have yet to meet. Some will be good, some will be bad, some in between. But one thing is certain, whatever happens, we will once again become as gods. Thanks for watching.